Okay, so let's start uh, <clears throat> lecture nine. The course is NE402, Intermediate Nuclear Engineering. And in the last lecture, lecture eight, I had started neutron diffusion, third in the series. I'll continue today from the last lecture. And uh, before I begin, I'll again repeat, uh, this is my name, this is my cell phone number, my personal email, my official email, and my personal website. Uh, the lectures are now on YouTube, and I hope I'll transfer them to my personal website. So let's uh, continue in this ninth lecture, and I hope I'll, I'll finish uh, diffusion by the next lecture. So just to take you back to what I had started in the previous lecture, uh, we were looking at two group neutron diffusion in a sphere of radius, uh, physical radius capital R, and it had a point isotropic source, S, emitting S neutrons um, per centimeter square per second at the center. <clears throat> so what I did was that uh, I multiplied the uh, surface area of this by the current in the limit as S, in the limit as R goes to zero, four pi R squared J1 is S, was the boundary condition for the first uh, on, on the left side and on the right side, I had a boundary condition uh, that of vanishing flux at the extrapolated radius. D1 is the extrapolation distance. Now, <clears throat> today I'll be uh, going through with you uh, for the group two case, which has a left boundary condition of zero current because there's no uh, source uh, at the center. There's no, there's no thermal or group two source at the center. And of course, on the right side, we've got the Dirichlet boundary condition of vanishing flux at the extrapolated radius. Uh, this is a problem. And uh, in, after I do this, I'm going to show you a solution where uh, phi 2 at 0 is 0. So, you know, it depends on what kind of a, uh, a situation you are dealing with. So yesterday, I had derived uh, the, the fast flux for you. And uh, I showed you a neat expression. So now let me continue over here. Uh, this is the expression I left you with yesterday. That phi 1 r is s over 4 pi d1 r. d1 is the diffusion coefficient, the fast diffusion coefficient, which you can understand to be the uh, uh, slowing down length. <clears throat> this is the dependence of the flux on r. It's a signed hyperbolic function. And uh, as you can see, when R is zero, then uh, this number is big and it cancels out with this and you're left with one over R. So yes, there is uh, a blow up of the flux at R equal to zero, but never mind because the source is at the center. So you don't want to find the flux at the center. There you want to apply the boundary condition. Okay, now let's uh, see whether our solution is correct or not. So the phi one that we've got, remember when you get a solution, there are two things I want to say in this lecture about why we're doing it. Number one is <coughs> that the two group model is a very useful model. The one group model is not a useful model. It's a model, it's a, it's a takeoff point, but the, the two group model is a practical, is a practically important problem. There are many, many things you can do with it. For example, variational methods you can do with it. Uh, it has been used a lot for uh, designing nuclear systems. Uh, in the early days, it was used uh, much more than it is now. Now it's a, it's a university thing, but it also has research significance. And if you go on to higher group, a higher uh, number of groups, uh, then you get what is called multi-group neutron diffusion. That is amenable to computational algorithms. And that is of course, very, very good and very, very practical. So in the deterministic approach, the multi-group diffusion is good. And this, what you're learning today, the two-group neutron diffusion formulation and the solution is a step in that direction. So let's check our solution first. Let's see if our phi one satisfies the boundary condition that we had imposed that four pi r squared j one is at, in the limit as r goes to zero is zero. So four pi r squared j, we use fixed law. Now let's uh, differentiate this expression over here, uh, u over v, v du by dr minus u dv by dr over v square. Uh, when you multiply, there's an r squared down here. 
and uh, I want to multiply this by four pi r square. So, uh, so what I've done is that, yeah, here's the four pi r square. So the four pi r square, so the r square goes away and you're left with the, with the four pi, which I have not uh, written over here, I forgot. So there's a four pi, r, four pi over here, a number, and it looks like this. So there's no r in the denominator. There's an r over here. If you put r equal to zero, you get sine hyperbolic r1 over square root of tau. And if you, sorry, if you put, yeah, you get sine hyperbolic r1 over tau, which cancels out with the denominator. If you put r equal to, uh, if you put r equal to zero here, yeah, so you get uh, a cosine hyperbolic over here. Okay, so uh, the, the cosine hyperbolic is uh, okay, but sorry, this R is over here. So you multiply, uh, so this term, not because of the cosine hyperbolic, but because of the R equal to zero goes to zero. Sorry, for a minute I doubted that there was something wrong over here. So this is perfectly okay. And uh, so this cancels out with the denominator and you're left with only the first term over here, which is S, so it's correct. Now. Let's see on the extrapolated uh, boundary, you've got uh, R equal to R1 bar. So cosine hyperbolic is one. So, uh, so sorry, you're not supposed to multiply by four pi R squared. So let's go to this expression over here. So let's put uh, R equal to uh, R1 bar over here. So what you get, you get sine hyperbolic of zero. Sine hyperbolic of zero is zero, and so the flux vanishes at the extrapolated boundary. Okay, so both these boundary conditions are satisfied, and so our solution is correct. Okay, now let's apply these boundary conditions to group two. The first boundary condition is that d phi two by dr is zero. So the first boundary condition, so here, there was a B3 and a B4 term. Now, let me take you back to what I got for phi two. I just want to show it to you once. So, because I showed that in the last lecture. And uh, take you back over here. So that was phi one application of the boundary conditions. And uh, So this was the phi two of the complementary, uh, where you had the B3 cosine hyperbolic over R plus B4 sine hyperbolic over R. The phi two particular gave you, uh, gave you uh, an expression in terms of phi one. And when you put the two together, then you got this solution. So you got B3 cosine hyperbolic R over L plus B4 sine hyperbolic R over L over r plus the phi one term of q. Okay. So, so let me now go to uh, where we were. So let's apply this to, uh, to phi two. Now the first boundary condition that I want to apply is d phi two by dr at r equal to zero should be zero. So as you can see, u over v, v du by dr minus u dv by dr over v square. Uh, here you get a d phi one by dr. So when you do this at zero, now at zero over here, you know the boundary condition for phi one. So you're supposed to put that over here. And when you do all that, then, then you put that over here and you get b three. So uh, b three is easy to get. It comes uh, straight away because uh, for b four, you can see that sine hyperbolic at zero is zero, cosine hyperbolic at zero is one, but multiplied by zero, that also became a zero. And the denominator, the R square, goes away when you multiply it by four pi R square, because that's the surface area of the sphere at limit of R goes going to zero. So from here, we do our uh, 
maths and we find that uh, V3 is this expression over here. Now, whenever you get an expression, and as I said, this is the first time I'm doing it, so I'm going through it step by step. So whenever you get an expression like this, then it's better that you look at things before you just do them mechanically. So, so look over here, you've got D2 divided by sigma 2. Now D2 divided by sigma 2 is the diffusion length square L square. So that we recognize. The other thing we recognize is that D1 divided by sigma 1 is tau. And we've got an extra D2 over here. So there are so many things you can do. You can cancel out this d2 with this d2. You can call this uh, tau. You can multiply this by this. You can get tau over L squared. So one possibility is that you write it in the denominator as slightly differently from what I've done. But if you just carry on with what I've done, there's a reason for this. So, uh, so I have let it be. So what I've done is that I have written the uh, sigma 1 over D, I paired them together. So sigma 1 over T1 times D2 over sigma 2. So the D2 over sigma 2 becomes L square and the D1 over sigma 1 in the denominator becomes a tau. So this number L square over tau, I would like to keep because remember that this number helped me to write it as a converging series. So what I had got was an infinite series. If you look at the previous lecture, lecture number eight, when I told you that the operator can be treated as a scalar and that I was taking it from the denominator to the numerator and I was writing it as an infinite series. And I told you I can only do that if it is a convergent series. And I told you that if it is not a convergent series then this method will break down. So it, it did turn out to be a convergent series. And the good thing was that L square over tau, I was able to recognize that as a parameter of interest. So it helped me over there. And that's why I'm going to keep it. Over. So I'm going to write B3 as S over four pi. And you know, this uh, four pi D is very important because remember in phi one, we got the expression that uh, S over four pi D one R. So that seemed to be a kind of natural scaling. So I would like to keep that here. Elegance in closed form expressions is very, very important. Okay. Now B4 is what we need. So let's apply the right boundary condition. The right boundary condition is that phi two at the extrapolated radius goes to zero, it vanishes. So I write the whole expression again, the B3 term, the B4 term, and the phi 1 term. Now notice one thing over here, that I am going to treat the R2 bar separate from the R1 bar, because the extrapolation distance d, the small d, depends on the transport mean free path. The transport mean free path depends on the macroscopic transport cross-section. The macroscopic transport cross-section in turn depends on the microscopic transport cross-section. And they're both different for fast and slow neutrons. So I would not like to mix them up at this stage. I would like to keep my solution general and I would like to treat them separately. Now, that's, that's, that is the, the truth. But uh, what's going to happen is that as a consequence of that, I'm not going to be able to put this term to zero, okay? So, so, you, so this is a non-zero term because phi one R2, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and uh, that depends on the numbers and that depends on, uh, on whether it's before or after. Okay, so let's do the mathematics now. Let's proceed with the mathematics. And what you can see is that by, by putting both of these uh, equal to zero, you get B4 is this. I've still kept this here. Now let's try to simplify things and let's say that it's zero. Okay? It doesn't have to be, but let's say that it is zero and I get an expression like this. So now what you notice, now what you notice is 
that there's a natural scaling over here. I've kept, I've retained the factor over here, which has L square over tau. There's a cosine hyperbolic term here and a sine hyperbolic term. There's a cotan hyperbolic term here. <coughs> so I'll take, I'll write this as cosine hyperbolic divided by sine hyperbolic. I'll take a common denominator that will take my sine hyperbolic R2 over L outside over here, which will perfectly match with the phi one solution. So, so it's correct. And, uh, and then I'll use the, the formula for cosine hyperbolic A plus or minus B. This thing I'm going to leave over here because this looks nice and neat with the particular solution showing up separately. Okay, so let me group the terms together and it is so nicely uh, seen that the two terms simplified and uh, see I can write my uh, phi 2 as very similar to the phi 1. So there's a sine hyperbolic R2 bar. And uh, so you see this, the similarity over here. So, uh, and this is the particular solution. So there's a lot of elegance in this solution. Now, now what you see, now you see the, the coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is S over four pi D1, one over sine hyperbolic R1 over square root of one. And beta is so similar to alpha. There's a group two diffusion coefficient. There's a group two extra, uh, extrapolated radius. Instead of the, uh, the, the the neutron age, I've got the diffusion length. Now in the, in, I think it was lecture six, I derived for you an expression for tau and I showed that it was one sixth of R bar square. R bar, R, where R was the distance from the point, uh, in that case, uh, of, uh, where a fission neutron slows down to a moderating cutoff energy. Now the same way I'd like you to think of L L is a diffusion length, and you can show it, I'll, I'll maybe mention it when I come there, but you can show that just as the neutron age is a measure of the slowing down distance from the point of emission as a fast neutron to some cutoff moderating energy EM, just like that, the diffusion length is a measure of the distance. So the diffusion length is also one over six R bar squared but the R is the distance from the point where it was emitted at some energy down to the point where it is absorbed. So, so the life of a neutron you can imagine has two phases. The first phase, it's a fast neutron slowing down. The second phase, it's a relatively slower neutron, but it's begun to diffuse. Now diffusion is, especially when you come down to thermal energies, it's a whole new world. It's the world of thermal physics. Now the world of thermal physics is very different from the world of the slowing down of neutrons. The physics changes. <clears throat> Why? Because when you come down to thermal energies, then, you, then the neutron has energies which are comparable with the host nuclei with which it is interacting. So whenever you've got energy which is comparable of the projectile and the target nucleus, then the, 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 project, the, the, the projectile can not only give, but it can take energy also. So thermal physics is, uh, is very different. And you've got all sorts of models. For example, I'll just mention one, there's the S alpha beta model. Now at, at that level, the physics has to be considered. The physics is very important. And that is why what we do is that we group uh, all the thermal neutrons into one flux called the thermal flux. There the physics of the problem is very different. And uh, if you think of it in another way the, way, the way I think of it is that when a neutron is fast, in slowing down, maybe it has 100 collisions or 200 collisions. But once it becomes a thermal neutron, it's going to have millions of collisions. Now, when it has millions of collisions, that is why we introduce the term of lethargy, that it is now becoming a lethargic neutron. A lethargic neutron is the opposite of an energetic neutron. So the physics of a lethargic neutron is, the, is what is called thermal physics. But 
broadly, the, the picture in your mind that you need to make is that tau represents a fast neutron and L represents a thermal neutron. So these are two distinct physics of the problems, as well as the mathematics, of course. Uh, so diffusion of neutrons is where you've got millions of neutrons. Fast slowing down is not where you've got millions of collisions. This is why you introduce the term lethargy. There's, there, there's so many interactions taking place. And thermal uh, energy uh, region in nuclear engineering is so important because that's where the fission cross-section of U235 uh, is high. And U235 is what most of our 440 nuclear reactors in the world are using the, the thermal fission of U235, where there's 3% enriched or 4% enriched or 5% enriched in the case of, you know, it's a mixture of these in PWRs, DWRs, or slightly higher at the FBRs. In fast breeder reactors, uh, it's mainly the fast flux. Now, I told you fast breeder reactors, if you want to read that story, then you start from the uh, Enrico Fermi, FBR, the Clementine, the uh, Phoenix in France, the Super Phoenix in France, then, uh, I hope I'm not missing, then now there's the Indian program, there's the Russian program, and there's the Chinese program. So, because in India, they've got a program where they're making a fast uh, breeder reactor, they have a lot of uh, uh, thorium, so they'll put thorium-232 in the blanket and they'll breed U-233. Uh, now, similarly, if you put U-238 in the blanket, you breed plutonium-239, which is what Phoenix did. Now, the earlier uh, reactors of the 60s and 70s, for example, the Fermi fast breeder reactor, those were not power reactors. Those were to demonstrate something. So they had enrichment of about 25% or so. So these two groups are really important when you're dealing with nuclear engineering design. So this is the physics of fast neutrons, which means fast reactors. And this is the physics of the 440 nuclear reactors in the world, which are called thermal reactors. Because they want to produce a thermal flux. And if you multiply this by sigma f, the fission cross-section, See, there's a space dependence. So if you multiply this by sigma f, integrate over the volume, in this case, it's a sphere. So if you were to make a spherical reactor, then if you were to integrate sigma f times phi 2r over the volume, uh, that would be the number of fissions. And each fission, let's say it gives you 200 MeV. So if you multiply that, you would get the MeVs that you get out of so many fissions. The MEVs you'd convert into joules, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. If you say how many you've got per second, because sigma F times phi times dV integrated from zero to R, the radius of the reactor, would give you the number of fissions per second. So the rate of fission. So that this would give you the joules per second. And what is a joule per second? It's a watt, it's a power. So if you were to design a 100 megawatt or a 300 megawatt or a 1000 megawatt reactor, then this is so important because this is the number of fissions multiplied. And when you multiply by the recoverable energy, you say how much power you're getting out of your nuclear reactor. So the mathematics of this was the mathematics of coupled ordinary differential equations. The engineering of this is that these two groups tell us about the behavior of the fast neutrons and the thermal neutrons. Thermal neutrons, I'll repeat that this is the physics, the science of about over 400 nuclear reactors in the world, which are producing 10% of the world's energy. And I told you that in the first and second lectures. So it's so important that you know the mathematics and the engineering. Okay. Now that we've got this, let's look at it. And whenever you get an answer, look at it for at least 20, 30 seconds. What do you see? You see this R in the denominator, which could become a problem for us. Uh, so 
how do we handle this when r goes to zero because this is finite this is not finite i mean one over zero is a bad term so uh, so it diverges so uh, so now this is the problem that it's a very good solution far away from the source so diffusion theory has its limitations okay but uh, we can uh, justify this by saying that there's a source the presence of a source at the center of the sphere says that do not use this to find the flux at the center of the sphere so i'm not going to do that and i am more interested in a volume average flux so yes that it would give me very well so uh, to summarize alpha beta gamma are okay you can calculate them by putting in the values i'll just show you some values for water and uh, you can calculate this by writing a two line matlab program you can plot the sine hyperbolic functions and this looks uh, neat it looks like it's coming down uh, as you go away from the center it is coming down which means it's a finite and good compact expression so if this is good then this is also good it's good everywhere except for r equal to 0 it satisfies the boundary conditions so it's an acceptable solution Okay, so this covers our very elaborate treatment of the mathematics of two-group diffusion. Now, this is the solution that I just showed you, in written in in MS Word, so it looks neat. So, what I I I had not planned that I'll I would take you through those derivations. I was going to just spend two minutes on on the derivation of this by telling you the steps in between, but then I thought. Uh, having taught in universities for decades so i thought that uh, this is where students uh, often have problems many students uh, do not say they don't speak up in class and maybe i was also one of those students so there are so many things that you don't know and you feel that is it going to be a stupid question am i going to uh, you know waste the professor's time is somebody going to snub me for this so so this is the purpose of taking you through the derivation of these two expressions no question is ever a stupid question uh, everybody starts with no knowledge works hard works their way out okay so now the solutions i have just shown you were for that sphere which i drew for you imagine if the sphere was an infinite medium and i told you what the word infinite means not for you and me it's for the neutron so the infinite in the neutron's world could fit into our drawing room so for an infinite medium what happens for an infinite medium the sine hyperbolic has a e plus and a e minus term so if you put the e plus terms to zero because you do not permit an exponential with a plus sign in a finite in a, in a infinite medium uh in the in the next week i'm going to take you through lectures on transport theory transport theory was developed from uh from radiative transfer and uh, it was developed for uh, studying uh the stars radiation coming from the stars they also calculated the uh, albedo of the earth and there was very good work by many many people and particularly that by chandra shekhar where he calculated the albedo of the earth so if you look at the 60s and 70s they all started with work of the infinite medium because uh because in space it's it's like infinite so phi1 reduces to the infinite case in such a compact expression which you'll see in many many books now there are two features of this that i want you to look at never mind the s over 4 pi d that's okay uh, it's the r dependent so this one is okay again this one a little bit uh, to think about that what happens at r equal to 0 well it blows up so don't use diffusion theory at r equal to 0 and here is the infinite solution for the thermal flux now in most of the textbooks you'll see these two expressions so because that's what they teach you at the undergraduate level but i wanted to show you the application of these two equations so i showed you the finite 
expressions. Okay, now let's put some numbers in. So <clears throat> let's keep it simple and let's consider something like water. So imagine that I have a sphere of water. Okay, in this example, I'm going to show you I've got a slab of water. So I've got a little water tank and uh, the tank is very, very long in the y direction. It's very, very high in the z, in the z direction. So it's, I'm just going to look at the thickness x. So this is an infinite slab in uh, two uh, dimensions and finite in the x direction. So in the x direction, it's got a thickness capital T. And I'm going to consider the domain from 0 to T. And I'm going to say that it's got an incident fast neutron source on the left face of this tank. So I'm doing an experiment. I've got a tank of water and I'm going to fire it with fast neutrons from the left side. When I fire it with fast neutrons from the left side, so this is what my two equations become. So the first group, the, the high, high, the energetic neutrons have this equation, uh, are described by this equation, and the slow or thermal neutrons are described by this equation. Again, you see D1, D2, sig R1, sig R2, and phi1 and phi2 are what I would like to calculate. The boundary conditions, the left boundary condition, remember I need four boundary conditions because this is a second order ODE, this is a second order ODE, they're both coupled through this term, so two over here and two over here makes me need four boundary conditions. So one of the boundary conditions is the left Neumann condition, and three of the boundary conditions are the left and right Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now this is the data I've got from Lamarche on the fast and thermal uh, cross-sections and diffusion coefficient for water. So for water, the diffusion coefficient is uh, D1, 1.1302, the sigma R1 is this much. So tau is sigma R1 divided by this. Okay. So that would give you tau. Now, uh, sorry, D1 divided by sigma R1. So this is about uh, 113 divided by 4. So what's 113 divided by 4? It's almost 30. So if this was 1.2, then 120 divided by 4 is 30. So this number would be less than 30. So, and uh, since I remember what the fast, what, what the slow, uh, age of neutrons, age to thermal of neutrons for water was, I did that in the, I think it was lecture seven. It was 27 centimeters squared. So if you divide this number by this, you should get something like 27. Okay, now if you divide this by this, then what is this by this? It's 11 divided by, you can say about two. So 11 divided by two is about five to six, because this is not really two, it's 1.67. So you'll get, let's say about six centimeters square as the as L square and 27 centimeters square as uh, tau. You see, from these numbers, you can estimate the slowing down length, uh, which is the square root of 27 is about five centimeters is the slowing down length in water. And the diffusion length in water I'm getting over here, 12 over two, about six. Square root of six is let's say about um, 2.5. So five and 2.5. So let's say in about roughly 7.5 centimeters, your neutron should be captured. Well, if not 7.5 centimeters, then about 10 centimeters. So you see, with the maths, that's the engineering. And let's say I have a source of one neutron per cubic centimeter per second. You will never have a source of one neutron per cubic centimeter per second, but you do all calculations for one neutron per cubic centimeter per second because it's an answer you can give everybody, and the sources available uh, vary from place to place and person to person. So they multiply by their own source strength, and they can estimate the fluxes. Okay, so when you uh, when you've got these numbers, then solve this equation again. Treat this like a scalar. The m1, m2 values are square root of uh, 1 over tau and minus 
square root of 1 over 2. Minus 1 over square root of 2. So I told you the tau is about 27, so this is about 5. So this scales by that factor. Phi 2 is again exponentials plus the coupling coming from uh, the fast flux. Now there I wrote alpha, beta, gamma. Here I'm writing, and there I had B1, B2, B3, B4. Here it's A1, A2, A3, and A4. So this is tau, that's L square. That's this little factor that I've kept. Now I, till now I had written this as L square over tau, but now I'm doing the arithmetic. So let's make it computer friendly. So I put in these values and you can see that I've got a little MATLAB program over here. Now, so I get tau is 27.008 centimeter square, L square is 6.6. .6. I told you it would be about six. So it's 6.6128. The beta, the coupling is 3.31. So the compact solution I get over here is just, you know, all that with 3.31 times the fast flux and the thermal flux. When you have those four boundary conditions, you solve them, matrix algebra, AX equal to B, where uh, x vector is phi 1 and phi 2. Uh, sorry, the x vector are the four a's, a1. Uh, yeah, so ax is a, it, it's a 4 by 4 matrix because you get four equations for the four a's. So you solve the 4 by 4 equation and you get a1 is minus 0 0.001, a2 is 2.2981, a3 is 0, a4 is minus 7.2. 6034. And this is the program I wrote for MATLAB. See, I put the density of water is one, the molecular weight. Now, I don't go into so many decimal places when I do rough calculations because I'll show you the whole purpose of this course is not to get very, very precise numbers from diffusion because at the end of this course, I'm going to show you Monte Carlo simulation. So that is as good as doing an experiment. So when I do my engineering, I don't use diffusion. These are my concepts. These are my building blocks, the foundations of my knowledge. And this is what every nuclear engineering student, everybody who's studying nuclear engineering must have in their minds the concept. Uh, otherwise, we come to a world where you have a big code, you press the buttons, close your eyes, have a cup of coffee, the answer comes out, the post-processing is done. Maybe, maybe 50 years from now, 100 years from now, that's what people will be doing. They'll have chips on their hands, fingers, God knows where, and then brains. So, but, but we did it the hard way. And uh, so this is the program. It's density, I put one. Molecular weight, 18. Avogadro number, 6.022, 10 to the 23. Now, why do I write 10 to the 24? Because the unit of a barn is 10 to the minus 24, and these will all cancel. So you find the number density of water molecules, water molecules, okay? So let me see over here, the number density of water molecules. Okay, uh, number density, not the gram density. This is the gram density. The SIG R1 I took from tables. Uh, it's so many bonds, 1.2508. The sigma transport I took from tables. The D1 I found out from one over three sigma transport, uh, the sig two R sigma transport two and the diffusion coefficient in the thermal group. Source, I took one neutron per centimeter square per second. So from the microscopic cross sections, I now build the macroscopic cross sections. So I multiply by this number density, which should be about 0 0.0334, 0 0.0333 times 10 to the 20. And you get the macroscopic cross sections. Now I note over here that I have not found the extrapolation distance. So this is a very, very rough calculation. So let me go up and show you what kind of boundary conditions did I use over here. Uh, so I've not used any extrapolation distance. Is that good or bad? Well, it's not so good, but it's okay for the time being. You want a better calculation, you must put small d and small d is 0.71 times the transport mean free path. So let me just write it down. Here. 
here. So D1 should be 0 0.71 times uh, 1 divided by, not here, sorry, because I don't have the microscope here. I should put it over here. So I should say D1 is 0 0.71. I don't see where I write D1. Zero point seven one times one divided by sig transport. Do I have a sig transport one? I don't have a sig transport one. So I have to make a sig transport one. Okay. So let me make a sig transport one. So SIG transport one is SIG, do I have a SIG S1? No, I don't even have a SIG S1. Okay, so then what I'll do is, I'll just say that D1, so what I'll say is that SIG transport one, because D is one over three SIG transport. So SIG transport, is one over three D, and I've got a diffusion coefficient. So I, I'll say that D is one over three sig transport. So the sig transport is one over three times D. So is one over three times D one. Okay, so that's okay. So this gives me a sig transport one. So I get a D one, and now, now it's okay. And similarly, I get a this for group two, okay, so this I get for group two over here. And you can run this MATLAB on your own because my MATLAB is not open now. So I get the extrapolation distance for the second one over here. And if you want, you can go back over here, up here, and you can change this, you can solve your four by four matrix again. And here you can just say that it's zero at T plus D one and at T plus D one. Okay, so I hope you understand this now that the right side fluxes are actually zero at the extrapolated boundary, not the physical boundary. But anyway, it gives you, I was just trying to get you an a good enough solution. Okay, so beta I calculate over here. The slab thickness I'm taking as 20. This is the four by four matrix from the four the four equations that you get by putting the uh, the boundary conditions. Ax equal to b. So and you solve for the coefficients a, and you use this expression for flux one, and you use this expression for flux two. Okay, so flux two has the flux one. I've made a function over here. I made a function at x, a one e to the x over square root of tau plus a two e to the minus x over square root of tau. That's f phi one, that's phi two. And here you can see the coupling through beta with phi one. So that's phi one. <clears throat> I take the domain of interest as zero to 20 with intervals of 0.1 centimeter. And I evaluate these two functions like this, and I plot my figure. Uh, I plot the phi one versus, uh, I plot x and phi one, x and phi two, I label them with the fluxes and I produce the legend. And this is what I get. Okay, now let's look at it carefully again. Uh, this tells you the whole story <clears throat> that the this curve is phi one. Okay. See how good it looks. Now in slab geometry, there's no blow up at x equal to zero. I think that's the reason I'm showing you slab geometry. So see over here, it's a finite value because there's no one over r over here. That's because of the Laplacian in in uh, in slab geometry which has d2 by dx squared. So the fast flux is dying out. You see that? From about 2.2, it comes to about half its value after four centimeters. Now, what was the value of tau? 
it was 25. So what's the square root of, oh, sorry, it was 27. So what's the square root of 27? It's 5.2 or whatever. So it's somewhere over here. So roughly speaking, roughly half value is over here. Then it comes down and it dies down to zero. In this model, I said it dies down at the physical boundary. But actually, it's going to be something here. See, that there is some gradient over here. So, But I made the gradient zero over here. I forced it to become zero here. That's how I specified the Dirichlet boundary condition. So, And what happens to the group two flux? Now, if you say, if you just look at it and say it's OK, then I'll say it's OK. But I want to show you something about it. And what I want to show you about it is that if you look at the boundary conditions, again, What did I say on the left boundary of the thermal flux? That it should be zero. And what did I say that it should be on the right boundary? Okay, so the fourth. Okay, so this should be phi two. Okay, so this is phi 2. What I meant was that this should be phi 2 and this should be d2. So, so what I said in the Dirichlet boundary conditions that the flux should be 0 on both of them. So that's why you're getting a solution for phi 2 which is 0 at the left boundary as well as at the right boundary. But what is so, so much more important than just satisfying the boundary conditions? Well, what is so much more important physically is that the source was a fast neutron source, not a thermal neutron source. Therefore, it did make sense to say that it should be zero here because no slowing down has taken place. No fast neutron has scattered down into the thermal group, as I told you about the probabilities. So nothing has come down into the thermal group. Okay. So it's good to assume that it's zero. And then it rises. See, there's a buildup of thermal flux. And it peaks somewhere around here. And then what happens to the thermal flux? Again, there's an e to the minus x over l fall off. So yes, these are producing these. But their number is going down. So their number is also going down. So their number is going down by two loss terms. One is the absorption. One is the, uh, the leakage. So these are, these are leaking out and they're getting absorbed. That's why they're dying out. These are dying out because they are leaking, plus they're getting converted into slow neutrons. So you see, this solution is, is so correct and so telling of what is happening in nature. OK, now there's a little exercise, again, from Lamarche and Barata using the table, uh, using uh, data from table 3.3. This is in Labarsh and Barata, page 254. And this is my book that you're going through. So I've used uh, uh, OK. So. I don't know what happened to my document. 